Hello, and welcome to This is Growing Old. My name is Michael Ward, and I am the Vice President of Public Policy at the Alliance for Aging Research. Being able to afford out-of-pocket prescription drug medications is a problem for millions of Americans, especially older adults. Every year, Medicare beneficiaries pay, on average, over $3,200 in out-of-pocket expenses for prescription drugs. For an older adult on a fixed income, this is no small chunk of change. Today, I'm joined by Amy Niles, Executive Vice President of the PAN Foundation. I'll talk to Amy about why out-of-pocket costs are so high, the real-world impacts of growing out-of-pocket costs for older adults, and what we can do about it. Amy, thank you so much for joining us today on This is Growing Old. Well, thanks for inviting me, Michael, and thanks to the Alliance for Aging Research for participating today. Well, it's our pleasure to, to have you, and I know that we're going to talk about some time-sensitive uh, items today, uh, so it, this, is a re- this is a really timely conversation due to the conversations going on in Capitol Hill around this, this issue. So uh, just for any listeners, we are recording the second week of November in case, uh, in case any things do change and, and when you, by the time that you listen to this podcast. So, Amy, as, as we talked about, you are the Executive Vice President of the PAN Foundation. So, for the audience, could you just please share a little bit about the mission of the PAN Foundation for, for the audience? Sure. I'm glad to. Um, the PAN Foundation stands for the Patient Access Network Foundation, but it's a very long name, so we typically go by PAN. Uh, we are an independent, not-for-profit organization. We were established in 2004. And our mission is to help people who are underinsured afford their treatment by providing grants that cover the out-of-pocket costs for their prescription medications. So we provide grants to people who are um, either federally insured, such as Medicare beneficiaries, or people who are commercially insured. Today, PAN operates around 70 different disease assistance programs, and they are helping people who are living with life-threatening, chronic, and rare diseases. So these are diseases like Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and heart failure. So just to give you an example, if you are uh, a Medicare beneficiary and you have Parkinson's disease, you're being treated in this country your medication is on our formulary, which is, which is very, very broad, and your household income is at or below 500% of the federal poverty level, you're eligible to receive a grant. And that grant will be, for Parkinson's, $3,200. Um, and that is designed to cover your out-of-pocket costs for a 12-month period. So we are, you know, we're humbled to be able to provide this support. Of course, we wish we didn't have to, um, but the healthcare system is such that we need to be here. So we are grateful that we have been able to provide help to more than 1 million patients since 2004. Um, in addition to the, the copay assistance that we provide, which has really been at the core of our safety net, we have other interests as well. Um, we know that patients have so many needs and there are many factors that can impede access to treatment. So as an example, over the last year, year and a half, uh, we launched a transportation program for our patients. What we know it's, you know, we can provide financial assistance, but people have to be able to get to their healthcare provider. They need to be able to get to their pharmacy to pick up their prescriptions. So our patients can now benefit from additional monies that can support their transportation needs. Another example is that we have launched a program to help people enroll in the federal low-income subsidy program. This is a terrific federal program. It's also called Extra Health, um, which covers the majority of -of out-of-pocket costs for prescription medications for very low-income beneficiaries. Um, Unfortunately, far too many people don't even know that this program program exists. So we're helping them um, enroll. And then finally, we have a growing and really evolving interest in social determinants of health. So things like transportation, food insecurity, housing issues, these are all issues that can impact one's ability to get treatment and stay on treatment. And so we want to do our share to help screen patients for other needs and really help them get uh, get to needed resources that uh, may exist nationally or in their communities. 
In addition to that safety net, I'll just add that a key part of what we do is to advocate for lower out-of-pocket costs. So we provide the assistance that that's needed, but at the end of the day, we want to lower those costs for patients. Absolutely. And Really, the work that, that the Penn Foundation does is so vital, and so just want to to pause to to thank you and and your colleagues for for all the work that you do day to day to help people access the care that they need. And so, I guess the next question I'll, I'll ask is, you know, specifically out of pocket costs for prescription drugs is is kind of the topic of the moment, and especially we see there's a number of seniors that receive their prescription drug coverage through Medicare that maybe have some unique challenges. So could you maybe tell us a little bit about why that's a case for those Medicare patients? Sure. You know, over the last, I guess, couple of decades, we, we've seen so much innovation um, in treatment of disease. And, and this is a great thing. So many new treatments are available now for people who are living with serious illness. But unfortunately, um, so many of these medications come with very high drug prices and very high out-of-pocket costs. Um, I'm reminded of a report that the Kaiser Family Foundation did a couple of years ago. Um, They looked at, I think it was 30 leading um, branded drugs on the market, um, treating people living with serious illnesses. And they looked at the out-of-pocket costs that patients were um, having to pay um, relating to these drugs. And the average out-of-pocket costs for these patients was around $8,000 for a 12-month period. It ranged from around 2,000, I think, on up to 16 or 17,000, but the average was 8,000. So if you can imagine being a Medicare beneficiary on fixed income of around $26,000, $8,000, $2,000 is a whole lot to, to afford. Medicare beneficiaries are the only group in this country that do not have a limit on what they pay out of pocket for their prescription medications. Everyone else has a limit. This is problematic. When we see Medicare beneficiaries get to the catastrophic phase of their benefit cycle um, in the benefit design, they're now paying 5% of drug costs. They have unlimited liability from that point on to the end of the year. So 5% sounds like a very low number, but 5% is uh, of an expensive drug. Um, is a high number. So these seniors um, and those on Medicare really need um, a limit to what they pay out of pocket. On top of that, another key problem is that their deductibles reset in January. Every single January this happens. So seniors are faced with hundreds, if not thousands of dollars to pay in out-of-pocket costs within the first few weeks of the year. It's actually when PAN and other charities like PAN are at are busiest. Our phones are ringing off the hook because people need that financial assistance and our patient portals are, are, are really busy. So not having the limit um, on out-of-pocket uh, cost spending and that front end of the year um, being so problematic are, are key issues for our seniors. And then, so I know that you all are working directly with patients at, you know, on the ground level, really kind of investing, you know, they, they tell you their stories and their particular situations. So you all understand uh, the real world situations and the impacts that, that patients are facing. And so could you just share uh, with us a little bit about, you know, some of the difficult decisions that patients do have to make and some of the real world impacts that that they may face if, you know, if they aren't able to, you know, able to connect with, uh, you know, with a foundation like PAN uh, that can help them uh, afford their medications. Yeah, no, there are real world impacts. And I always say the last thing anyone should need to think about when they're diagnosed with a serious illness is how to pay for their medications or how to pay for their, for their care. They should be solely focused on, on getting better. Um, But people who are living on fixed incomes are making unfortunate decisions every single day. So we we hear this from our patients every day, and we've done a lot of survey work, and it kind of validates what we're hearing from patients. Um, They are making decisions whether to put food on their table, pay rent, or afford their medications. And oftentimes the decision is that food is is going to be more important. They are deciding to split pills in half 
because to them, that's a way to make the treatment last longer and therefore have reduced costs. But that's not good for the patient, right? The, the healthcare provider has prescribed in a certain way and that shouldn't be altered. And, you know, most dramatically, they're simply walking away from the pharmacy counter um, when they hear what they may need to pay out of pocket. It doesn't take so much um, for someone to walk away from the pharmacy counter. It, it might be $40 or $50, and the patient says, I, I simply cannot afford that. So imagine being told, you know, hundreds of dollars or even thousands of dollars. So these deci- decisions are unfortunate. No one should have to choose um, between food and, and medications, and they can obviously impact one's health both short and long term. Yeah, I think that's a, a really important point. I know there's been some research that came out earlier this year that showed that you know patients really feel these uh, effects of out-of-pocket cost and sensitivity to whether those costs grow you know, even if they aren't of, of lower income, that really patients of, of all uh, all income levels really, you know, so it really is um, a challenge for them to be able to afford the medications. And and often, you know, they do make those difficult decisions to maybe think about food and place other things above, above medicines. Yeah, I, I would just add that in addition to, you know, walking away from the pharmacy counter, another decision they could make, which we never want someone to make, is to dip into retirement savings or a 401ks to to pay for what's necessary. So, you know, we know that so many people in this country are in medical debt. And again, that's that's an unfortunate situation. We, we want people to get better. We want people to be able to access the prescription medications they need. Absolutely. And so as, you know, as we talked a little bit about at the, the top of the conversation, there is an ongoing discussion in, in Washington, D.C. at the federal level about, about maybe changing some of the rules around Medicare uh, and prescription drug, how patients, um, the, the out-of-pocket costs they face, you know, when they're, they're trying to procure prescription drugs. And uh, I'll just mention as a sidebar that the Alliance for Aging Research uh, currently convenes a project called uh, Project Loop, which is an ad hoc coalition of patients and organizations committed to addressing patients' costs for prescription drugs. Um, And Loop stands for lower out-of-pocket. And so maybe for our audience, can you describe the key policies that could lower out-of-pocket costs for older adults? Sure. And and I'll just add, as you know, the PAN Foundation has worked closely as well with the Alliance for Aging Research. And I I know our two organizations share similar perspectives um, on how to lower out-of-pocket costs. So um, there are a number of things that we advocate for at PAN. And first and foremost is this notion of a Part D cap. Um, The Medicare Part D program must be reformed to have a cap so that seniors and beneficiaries in general um, have a limit on what they're paying over a 12-month period for for their prescription medications. And we advocate for as low a cap as possible. The second policy is this notion of smoothing. So I spoke earlier about how problematic January is for our Medicare beneficiaries when the deductible is reset. So instead of facing this enormous financial burden at the beginning of the year, it would be very nice if our beneficiaries had more predictability and could budget better. And that means that these costs were evenly distributed throughout um, the entire year. It's it's like placing a monthly cap um, on out-of-pocket costs. It it will allow them to budget and just... um, uh, not incur so much uh, cost at the beginning of the year. So those are two policy solutions that we have stayed true to over the many years at, at PAN. I know you're advocating that as well. There are a few things that we would love to see as well. Um, the third um, policy relates to the low-income subsidy program. So right now that program is benefiting Um, our most financially vulnerable, and it's individuals who um, have household income up to 150% of the federal poverty level. We would love to see that threshold increase to 200% so that more individuals could benefit from from really a terrific program. Another um, policy that we think is really important is um, removing any immunization copays 
um, from cur for current and future vaccines that might be developed. Um, you know, we certainly have seen through the pandemic. You know, no no one had to pay any copays um, for the COVID vaccine. Well, we would like to see this similarly applied for for uh, future vaccines. And then finally, I would just like to touch on um, the importance of dental, vision, and hearing benefits in the Medicare program. Um, we know these services are vitally important um, for our seniors, um, and we know that our seniors are paying a lot out of pocket for these services. And um, we would love to see the Medicare program um, expanded to include, include these services. Um, they're all very important. I, I know that dental services are expensive, um, but it's vitally needed for, for um, our beneficiaries and would love to see reform in that regard. Absolutely. And I, I know that in addition to the out-of-pocket cost reforms, the cap and the smoothing that you mentioned, uh, that the current reconciliation bill as it currently stands does have provisions around vaccinations, both in terms of, of, of eliminating that copay and the Medicare program uh, for CDC recommended vaccines for the for the older adult population and then but also uh, kind of a little known fact is that in in the Amer in the Affordable Care Act it actually eliminated copays for vaccines for states that accepted the Medicaid expansion however uh, there were many states that did not accept the expansion and so uh, currently in the bill right now there's also a provision that would uh, would actually kind of create parity. So if, if you lived in a non-expansion state, you would also benefit from not having any copays as part of the Medicaid program. And so uh, those those are uh, exciting things to, to have in there. And uh, we do hope that they'll, you know, they'll end up being in the final product. So uh, with that being said, uh, you know, not, nothing is final, right? Nothing is final. It seems like every day is, is a new day. But we were pleased to see the immunization piece added. Um, and just, you know, while we're talking about the, the current congressional focus on the Part D cap, um, one, obviously, we're glad it's there. Two, we were very glad to see that it's $2,000. I know in the past, the Senate Finance Committee has considered a cap of $3,100, which would still be an improvement over what we have today. But, you know, clearly, we would love to see as low a cap as possible. Um and smoothing is currently in the bill as well, which is, you know, terrific. We hope that at the end of the day, when this is finalized, that smoothing provision is really as simple as possible for patients. Um, we don't want patients also to have to meet certain financial thresholds before smoothing kicks in. Uh, we want it to begin really on day one, um, and, and we want this option to be available for everyone, for all Medicare beneficiaries. Um, we hope that as it moves forward, um, CMS is thinking about education that will be needed around cap and smoothing because you and I talk about this every single day. Um, but for the, the person out there, it's, it's sometimes hard to understand. So I think patients will need a whole lot of education. So, so definitely we, you know, that's a piece that's missing in terms of, uh, you know, maybe education around smoothing. And I know we talked about hearing dental and vision would be great to, to have in the final bill that may not, you may not be there currently. Are there any changes in terms of the affordability provisions, um, you know, around out-of-pocket costs or anything else that you think could maximize the ability of patients to benefit from potential changes that Congress could still make to the legislation? Um, you know, from our perspective, it's not too late to include the low income subsidy program expansion um, in the bill. And, you know, I mentioned earlier about dental vision and hearing. At the end of the day, we completely understand that you need to have pay fors and the drug pricing legislation piece of this has to, you know, provide the, the, the funds to, to pay for all of this. And, you know, there'll be priorities and there'll be compromises and negotiations. So we understand that things, you know, may need to drop out. But from our perspective, the, the Part D cap and smoothing must not drop out. Um, that, that must stay in. Absolutely. I think that's 100% right. And I think to your point, there's still an opportunity for patients to to contact our legislators to let them know that these changes are needed because, you know, your your voices are really the ones, especially as constituents, are the ones that these offices listen to most. 
you know, I'm glad you brought that up because I think that is key. Um, you know, there is a lot of a lot of voice that we can provide as patient advocacy organizations, but I think bringing the patient voices to the Hill are that's most impactful. So um, we have over this past year, we've had a um, what we call a grassroots campaign relating to cap and smoothing. We've been encouraging um, patients to send their messages to members of Congress. I would say that over the last couple of weeks, we have reinvigorated that campaign and, and really encouraging you know, now is the time to, to send your messages to Congress as they are negotiating and, um, you know, looking to finalize a bill soon. Yeah, I think I think that's very important. And, I, and this is, uh, I'll just uh, take a, a brief moment. And this is a representative of the alliancing position, alliances position, uh, not may not represent, uh, you know, Pan Foundation's position, but, you know, certainly from, I think, I think, you know, as we're considering this bill holistically, I think, you know, there's a lot of great things in, in this bill for patients, right? We've, we've talked about a lot of those things. I think it it's important for patients to also think about other pieces of the bill uh, that are under discussion, because this is, you know, a huge bill that and it's not only healthcare, it's actually other things as well. But within the healthcare realm, there's things that are not affordability related, but that they could, there are provisions that could impact patient access to, pres- to prescription drugs, uh, there's, you know, for example, there's discussion around the government setting a maximum price as a way to help control costs to help pay for some of these other provisions that, that we're talking about that would be really helpful. However, there's a trade-off in that some of those things could result in reduced access to medications that are currently on the market or potentially to future drugs. And, uh, you know, and it's also just important, I think, to recognize that the, the cost of prescription drugs is just very complex. Uh, there are many factors that lead to higher drug prices, such as is just an example, you know, that Medicare forces patients to pay their coinsurance, which is the percentage of a drug's cost based on the list price, which is kind of the sticker price of a medication rather than a percentage of the net price that that your insurer or that your employer might actually pay for a drug. And so it's these, and there are other types of changes as well that Congress could consider that could really help lead to additional affordability uh, and as well as may have minimal impact on the current access that U.S. consumers have to innovative uh, therapeutics. So I just wanted to, to note that. And then I guess going to the next question, you know, we're, while we're hoping for these affordability provisions to move from proposals to, to law to really benefit patients soon, uh, you know, there's always a chance that deliberations won't cross the finish line. So I think, you know, just in the context of today, potentially in the future. I know that you all are, are you know, the Penn Foundation is going to be helping patients regardless of what happens here. So what options are uh, available today for older adults who can't afford their prescriptions because of high out-of-pocket costs? Um, the options are limited, um, unfortunately. So, you know, as, as you know, pharmaceutical companies um, are prohibited from providing direct financial assistance to people with federal insurance. Um which is why the charities like, like PAN are so important, kind of filling this tremendous need within the safety net. Um, so right now there are nine charities and, and organizations that provide copay assistance. Um, we are one of, I think it's six independent um, charitable foundations. And the problem is, I mean, we're all doing great work and we're all helping so many patients, but the need is far greater than all of us collectively, um, you know, could provide that that service. And, and on any given day, all the programs that we operate, and there are 200 plus programs between these nine organizations, some are open, meaning there's funding available to give grants and some assistance programs are closed, meaning waiting for money to, to come in so we can start giving grants again. And it is very variable and that's just sort of the, the nature of the beast. And it's a little bit unpredictable, but we're grateful when we are able to give that assistance. But if you can imagine how difficult it is for a patient to kind of figure out, there's, if you know about the nine organizations, Um, who's providing what, where do I go, what's open, what's closed. And so I I wanted to take this moment to just mention a really great program that the PAN Foundation started a couple of years ago called Fund Finder. And Fund Finder is a web app. And what we've done is through technology track 
the available assistance at all of these nine organizations. Sort of in real time, the information is updated every single hour. So if you register as a user of FundFinder, and you can do so at fundfinder.org, you can you know, follow different disease um, assistance programs. So I'm going to make up an example, and I don't know whether this is true or not, but just for the interest of, of explaining this, let's say you are a patient uh, living with Parkinson's disease. And let's say there are three charities today, three charitable foundations that operate um, Parkinson's programs. But today, all of them are closed. Okay? So you have registered for FundFinder. You're interested in receiving alerts about Parkinson's. Tomorrow, the program at the Pan Foundation opens and we are able to give grants to patients. Tomorrow, you would receive an alert via text or email saying the Pan Foundation is open. And that really prompts you to call us or to go onto our patient portal to apply for assistance. It's really been a a game changer, um, not only for patients. I mean, we're saving them so much time and it's so much easier to look for assistance, but we're also helping our healthcare providers and pharmacy staff who have also faced the same challenges. Um, and we're helping people in call centers. You know, I, I work with organizations who receive a lot of calls from patients looking for financial assistance, and they're able to use this app to respond to patient needs. So that is an important program that we hope, you know, many people will use um, until such day that charitable foundations may not be needed. Absolutely. And so, and just for just for our listeners again, could you mention the name of the fund, how to get to fund finder as well as the Pan Foundation's website? Sure. Um, the Pan Foundation's website is simply panfoundation.org. And when someone goes there, they will see immediately um, all of the disease assistance programs that we operate. They can begin applying for assistance right on our homepage. We have a huge advocacy section so they can learn more about the positions that we advocate for, um, along with our grassroots campaigns. And FundFinder can be found at fundfinder.org. Great. So as we come to the the end of our time together today, just want to tee up two questions for you, Amy, that we we ask of all of our guests. Uh Uh-oh. So I I know it's a, it's, it's a constant. And, and so uh, you you get to, you get to enjoy them as well. So (laughs) when you were a kid, um, when you're a kid, what did you imagine growing older would be like? And then as you've, as we've all aged and um, you know, kind of what has been the most pleasant surprise? Those are great questions. You know, when I was a child, and maybe a young teenager, that's many years ago, um, I, I would think about the year 2000, and it would seem like so far away, and I would be middle-aged. And, you know, to me, I wouldn't worry about aging because it was so, so far away. And I think about my mother, who was truly a role model for me. She was productive. She worked full-time as an educator. She raised three kids. We dealt as a family with a lot of serious illness directly within the family. But it's interesting because one thing I never heard mention was anything relating to financial distress. Never heard any conversations about being able, about being able to afford medications or you know hospital stays or or anything like that. Um, so. You know, as I think about now, I'm a mother um, and I have a family. I want to be a lot like my mother. I want to be a role model. Um, I want to work for a very long time. I also, you know, I, I hoped that the healthcare system would be taking care of all of us and that no one would be able, no one would have to worry about how to pay uh, for care. Um, I, I never really thought about it much as, as a child. I just assumed that it was all taken care of, you know, government or someone was taking care of it. It wasn't us, but, you know, clearly n- now that I've grown up and have worked in, in, in this area, we, we 
clearly have a lot of gaps um, and so many challenges relating to access and affordability. What's pleasantly surprised me, I think that um, honestly, so many older adults are working. They are productively contributing in their communities. And that I think is a, a very good thing. Um, what has surprised me recently perhaps is how telehealth has really helped so many older adults, you know, especially if you look back on this past year, year and a half um, with the pandemic, um, telehealth, I think, did a lot to help our seniors stay connected with their healthcare providers and hopefully stay in good health as a result. Um, and then the other thing I would add relates to social media. You know, social media can have its downsides, but I think for many of our older adults, social media has been a good thing. It has allowed them to connect in new ways with family members, you know, grandmas and grandpas connecting with their grandsons and daughters. And I think at the end of the day, if we can prevent some social isolation, that's a good thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Amy, I just want to thank you again for joining us today. It's It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Oh, I, I truly enjoyed this. And thanks again for, for inviting me to do this. Yeah, our, our pleasure. So that's it for this week's episode. As Amy mentioned, you can learn more about the Pan Foundation at panfoundation.org. To learn more about how the Alliance for Aging Research is advocating for meaningful drug pricing reform, please visit agingresearch.org forward slash drug pricing. To learn about easy ways to contact your elected officials about the issues that we discussed today, you can visit loweroutofpocketcost.org. Thank you for listening to This Is Growing Old. If you're enjoying the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts or the streaming service of your choice. Have a great day.